Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's Ask the Expert webinar on polymeric material investigations. Our experts for today are Dr. Jennifer Hoffman, Director of Project Management, Dr. Carolyn Otten, Senior Manager of Analytical Services. Our moderator for today is Dr. Janneke Schneider, Senior Scientist and Project Manager. And I'm Melissa Campbell, Marketing Manager, assisting with today's event. Before we get started, just a couple housekeeping items. All attendees are muted. However, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the question section located in the bottom of your control panel. You can send in questions at any time, and if time permits, we will answer these questions during today's event, or we will follow up with you in the coming week. With the abundance of pre-submitted questions for today's event, we unfortunately will not be able to get to all of them during the presentation. However, if your question is unanswered, the team will follow up with an answer for you by email. At the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up on your screen and your feedback is greatly appreciated. Now I will turn it over to one of our experts and moderator for today, Dr. Janneke Schneider. Thank you very much. Okay, so for today's agenda, we'll start with a brief introduction to Eurofint EAG, um, and then we're gonna discuss uh, our approach to polymeric material investigations. And of course, the focus of our presentation today is your question. So we're gonna look at metrology-related questions, as well as some really interesting case studies that address your questions. Uh, we will uh, wrap up with the additional Q&A and end with our summary. So who is Eurofins? Um, well, we are a, a leader in scientific testing, uh, specifically materials testing. Uh, we have more than a thousand um, educator employees. We have labs at 20 different locations, um, and we have thousands of clients all over the world. And, and we work with so many different industries from semiconductor to automotive, to pharmaceuticals, to uh, chemicals and raw materials. We help clients throughout um, different stages of the entire product life cycle, from R&D to quality assurance to manufacturing support, and we, we do quite a bit of work in, in failure analysis as well. Uh, and here is our famous smart chart. This is a, an excellent way to determine um, the best technique to use for a given application. Uh, so this chart compares the spot size with the detection limit, and it's uh, quite useful. Here's another version of our chart, but it looks specifically at the depth of analysis. We have many different techniques, and some of them are very surface sensitive, while all the others look at the bulk properties. And in terms of uh, the types of polymer investigations we do at EAG, again, it's, it's quite a large variety. We do um, a lot of work in, in deformulations for either IP infringement or to help our clients source different suppliers. We also do a lot of product development support. We help clients screen materials, um, do reliability studies, and so on. And our bread and butter is failure analysis. So I have some nice pictures here showing cracked parts, crack, cracking in plastic parts, um, uh, an SEM image showing a, a defect or an inclusion. So that's the kind of um, analyses that are requested from our clients, looking at delaminations, uh, understanding curing and process issues, chemical attack, um, and a lot of contamination analysis. Okay. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Jennifer, and she's going to talk about metrologies. Excellent. Thank you, Janneke. Much appreciated. So we got a lot of questions regarding um, the techniques that we use for, for polymeric investigations and just kind of general, what, wanting to know uh, a general understanding and then maybe some specific questions that we will address in the um, in this in these slides uh, where 
where they want to know sort of comparative uh, techniques. What can these techniques do uh, that others can't do? That sort of thing. So we're going to address some of these in the coming slides. And I think we'll start with sort of our bread and butter. Uh, a lot of the failure investigations that we get are related to contaminants, impurities, and leachables. And we have a wide array of techniques that are commonly used for evaluating different types of species. And really, it, it depends on the nature of the species, whether it's something that you can see with the naked eye or a little bit of uh, magnification, um, if it's organic versus inorganic, if it's on the surface or something that's in the bulk that needs to be extracted, for instance. Um, and if it's a, a low concentration versus more of a bulk weight percent concentration, we have certain you know, detection limits with our techniques. So it re really kind of na narrows down into a few techniques that are used as complementary techniques for these types of investigations. So the first question is, can FTIR alone detect if contamination is organic or inorganic, or is FTIR always paired with another testing technique? Well, sometimes uh, FTIR, well, FTIR is a common technique that we employ uh, for a lot of these investigations um, initially, just to get a, an idea of the, the nature of the contamination. But you can kind of tell by if you can see it visibly, what it looks like, if it, if it looks to be um, like a liquid or some sort of, uh, uh, you know, a clear residue, it's likely organic. But um, it may be, uh, it may be uh, adequate if the contaminant is present in a high enough concentration, which we'll get into a little bit more about detection limits uh, shortly. However, um, generally speaking, complementary techniques are, are used, especially if there's no clear suspected source to the contamination. Um, the next question is, uh, how do you determine the cause of delamination? Typically, what we've seen um, is that when, when you have a delamination, either a coating or adhesive or a multi-layer film is delaminating, that it's often due to the presence of an organic, organic contamination. So even if it's not visible, we start with FTIR, um, but likely it requires requires surface sensitive techniques like TOF SIMS and XPS, where you're analyzing the mating surfaces of a fresh delamination, and then you're comparing to control samples to, to determine what's different. And then another question we got was, do you have recommended methods for checking the leachables from polymer materials? And uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, extractables and leachables testing related to consumer products and also for medical device, and it follows the guidelines of ISO 10993 Part 18. Um, basically, we select the appropriate um, media, polar, semipolar, nonpolar. It really depends on the end use. And then we follow with per performing techniques like ICPMS, GCMS, and LCMS um, to look for volatiles and trace metals. Another question we got is uh, just comparing between the vibrational spectroscopy techniques, FTIR, Raman, and Nano IR, which is a newer, newer technique to EAG. Um, and we recently had a webinar on vibrational spectroscopies uh, with more detailed information. But here I'm just giving you kind of a snapshot. Generally, uh, you're, what we're probing with these techniques is um, Molecules are made up of bonds and they vibrate, stretch, and bend in response to infrared and visible light at specific wavelengths. FTIR, nano IR are utilizing um, infrared light. And IR active materials, there's a change in the dipole moment. Whereas Raman relies on visible light at very specific wavelengths. And you're looking at changes in polarizability to, to be Raman active. Um, and other things to point out here, the differences between the techniques um, with nano IR, which we'll talk about a little bit later, you can use it for doing, it's basically an AFM based technique. So you can do um, imaging, uh, mapping and uh, get topography information as well. And really the difference, the primary difference is spot size. So these all ha are, are considered bulk techniques, five to 20 weight percent. Uh, really you're detecting major components um, in the materials that you're looking at. And the, the spot size is the big difference. So with nano IR, you can get down to less than 30 nanometers. 
um, Raman down to one micron, and then FTIR, uh, you know, tens to hundreds of microns. But the spot sizes are very different. In addition, the spectral libraries that we use for matching and for, for helping with interpretation is um, more limited for Raman. It's about uh, 10x. Uh, uh, smaller library um, and then we also create our we, we add to the libraries and create our own we'll talk about that a little bit later too so now i'm going to turn this over to carolyn to speak to the next section thanks jennifer all right so uh the next question has to do with polymer identification and quantitation so uh, which technique is most suited to determine the composition, including contaminations of polymeric materials? So two, two questions here. A few, fly, a few slides ago, Jennifer talked about the techniques that were kind of most appropriate for contaminations. So I'll more address the bulk polymeric materials. So the good news is that we have a bunch of different techniques. We have a big toolbox for analyzing polymers. They all tell us something slightly different and then we can kind of refine the information. So we just kind of went over the spectroscopy, FTIR, Raman, that's for chemical family, bulk characterization. If you want to get into more specifics, like if FTIR has told you it's a polyurethane, um, but you want to know more about you know, the isocyanate or the polyol, or if there's a chain extender, you might move on to NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, often used in tandem with NMR is pyrolysis GCMS. It gets you structural information based on you know, pieces of the polymer chain. Um, it has the advantage of you don't have to get your sample into solution, so it's useful for cross-link materials. And a, te a thermal technique such as DSC, differential scanning calorimetry, um, is useful in that, you know, perhaps again, FTIR will tell you or suggest that it's a nylon material, but if you want to know specifically what type of nylon, DSC uh, can help you determine that based on the melting temperature. Um, the next question, what are advantages, disadvantages of using FTIR versus, you know, the, the common NMR um, experiments, proton and, and carbon-13? So uh, for FTIR, um, there's many different types of, of ways that you can sample it, but for the most part, uh, there's usually a way that you can do it that involves minimal sample prep, usually like an ATR technique. Um, the technique is used for screening, so it's quick, it's relatively inexpensive. Um, it does have extensive commercial libraries that, that Jennifer alluded to, um, but it does have some disadvantages. Um, although quantitation is possible, it's a little more challenging in that you really do need to have sort of like a matrix match um, of standards of known composition. Um, the peak intensity also uh varies based on the sampling technique so you might get a little bit different spectrum depending on whether you're doing transmission versus an atr technique so you need to take that into account and then also the signals from multiple components in a mixture overlap one another and sometimes they can mask one another um, so nmr um, overlapping signals i would say is less of a problem although you still can get some overlap um, you can use it for uh, determining relative ratios of known components without standards. So, um, again, uh, if you want to know, you know, the relative ratio of monomer A to monomer B, you can determine that. Um, there's uh, multiple different ways that you can quantify. You can use an internal standard. Again, you can use that relative monomer uh, quantitation, or you could use a commercial standard to do a comparison of the peak integrations. Um, we've also used the method of standard addition for NMR for, for difficult components. Uh, the disadvantages, uh, we already mentioned, um, we primarily do solution phase NMR here. Um, so that requires your sample to be in solution. Uh, inorganic fillers and in metals sometimes can cause a problem uh, with, with the signal. So you're gonna have to do some sample prep in order to filter some of those things out. And um, sometimes uh, the percent abundance of the nuclei that you're probing um, 
is is you know not as abundant as you would like so for example carbon 13 is only one percent abundant and so it just means that you have to collect the data longer in order to get a good signal to noise ratio all right so moving on to polymer additives so um most of you, I would imagine, understand what I mean by polymer additives, but if you don't, uh, we may think, mean things within the polymer formulation, such as colorants, inorganic fillers or reinforcements, antimicrobials, flame retardants, lubricants, impact modifiers, stabilizers, which may include antioxidants, UV absorbers, and light stabilizers. And, you know, we can, uh, analyze these with multiple different analytical techniques. But um, the questions have come up. So how do you know if your polymer material has enough antioxidant in the blend? So that's a little bit of a tricky question. Uh, there's not a straightforward answer, but there is sort of generally accepted um, levels that are commonly used out there in the literature to kind of give you know a, a rough idea of, of what to expect. But the exact amount varies based on the polymer type, um, based on the application of the polymer, and also other components within that polymer formulation. So uh, oftentimes, uh, if you're looking at a sample that has been experiencing you know, negative uh, negative uh, performance characteristics, you would want to do a comparison between like a good and a bad or a good and a suspect. And that way you'll have a baseline for, you know, if you have a, a, a good sample that has been performing well, you know, some of those antioxidants, you know, may have degraded in the field as they're designed. And so you want to know um, for a sample that's been in use, what's considered acceptable. That way you can determine if the level is lower is it significant? And so um, that's the answer to that. So then uh, the next question is, what is the best method to identify antimicrobial types added to polymeric materials? And again, the answer is it depends. Um, so uh, you have to kind of get some more information. So what is the polymer type? What is the application? So for example, if we were talking about a textile, um, sometimes they use, you know, nano size silver to be used as antimicrobial. Um, so you might use a technique like SEMEDS, XRF, or ICP in order to look for those metallic. Um, but if you're looking for antimicrobials, for example, in, um, in a soap, um, those tend to be more organic materials. And so you might use a technique like GCMS or LCMS. And again, do a little bit of research of what type of components to expect. All right, so now we'll move on to polymer degradation. So we actually received a lot of questions um, regarding polymer degradation. So um, what are the best, best methods to comparatively or quantitatively analyze degradation in polymeric materials? So uh, we've compiled a table here. We've already talked about some of these techniques, um, but uh, the table here sort of lists, you know, the common ones, um, whether they're spectroscopic, chromatographic, thermal techniques, or microscopy techniques. And um, we sort of, group them together and describe what about those techniques um, is the, the method capable of detecting and how does that suggest that there could be polymer degradation. So we have a FTIR, or um, excuse me, a, a Raman spectrum here on the right that's uh, showing evidence of what we would expect for a, a virgin polyethylene material um, versus degraded. Um, so there are some clues and oftentimes you can combine techniques in order to sort of give you a more clear picture of what's going on. All right, so um, moving on to additional techniques um, that are helpful in studying degradation. Um, so this technique uh, I'm going to talk to here um, is called pyrolysis GCMS. And uh, we believe that 
this would be a good technique to use for some of the questions that were submitted here. So what techniques are needed to determine components in the chemical structure of a silicone type of polymer? And what would be the best combination of analytical methods to identify silicon containing polymers such as siloxanes, silazanes, and carboxylanes? So this is a technique, again, it, it has some additional features that is attached to a GCMS, but it's designed particularly for polymer analysis. Again, it doesn't require the sample to go into solution, so, and it also doesn't require very much material at all. So that's something else that's useful and that you don't need very much material. But uh, basically, pyrolysis GCMS, it can give you different types of information based on the experiment that you're running. You can also customize these experiments. But uh, to sort of understand information both about additives and small molecules that may be associated with polymers, in addition to getting information about the polymer chain itself, we would often run this in uh, a double shot analysis. So here we actually performed a double shot analysis pyrolysis run on a silicone face mask to get information about, you know, its composition. And so you're actually taking the sample and it's performing what's called a desorption step. This is happening at a lower temperature and at a temperature that shouldn't be degrading the polymer chain. So it's in an inert environment. There shouldn't be combustion going on. And what we see here is a series of cyclosiloxanes. And then we move on to, it goes kind of to the next step of the method. It performs pyrolysis, which is at a temperature that's going to break up the polymer chain into pieces. Um, and so what we note here is we see a series of cyclosiloxanes in the desorption step. And so how this can be helpful to determine whether or not there's degradation is, again, if you have a comparative analysis, good versus bad, um, you can compare both the desorption step and the pyrolysis step of good versus bad to one another. And if you see components representative of small molecules in the desorption step that are not in the pyrolysis step, that might be an indication that your polymer is breaking down. Because um, normally at that temperature, if they're still incorporated in the polymer, it wouldn't be hot enough in order to be able to uh, volatilize these, they're still stuck in the polymer chain. Um, so then moving on to another technique good for degradation analysis is gel permeation chromatography, also known as GPC. It's also known as size exclusion chromatography. So just a little bit about that technique. Um, again, it's a chromatography technique, so it's a separation te technique. Uh, it involves uh, solubilizing your polymer into solution. So if you can't get your polymer into solution, it's not going to work. So it may be a problem with cross-link materials. Um, but once your sample is in solution, you know, it gets eluded into the column. The column, of course, is packed with stationary phase, um, which are components. In this case, it's a bunch of, you know, porous materials. So based on the size of the polymer or whatever, you know, molecule you're introducing into the column, uh, the smaller molecules are going to be able to react with the stationary phase and enter the pores. So it's a porous network, so it's sort of like getting lost in a maze. So um, the larger molecules, they're too big. They're not going to be able to fit in the pores. So ac they actually exit the column in a shorter period of time than the smaller molecules, and that's what aids in the separation. And so in the chromatogram that you see below, um, the way that it's set up, the larger molecular weight species come out first and the smaller molecular weight species come out afterwards. And so um, for, if you're doing again, a comparative analysis between a virgin and degraded sample, um, if your sample's thermally degrading, pieces of the polymer are coming off and it's like changing the average molecular weight. And so you would expect, expect to see a shift to the left, which is what, um, the graph is showing right there. And an example for, you know, how we, we use this in a real life um, case study, we had a medical device company that had a polyurethane based catheter. And it turned out that these things were being packaged, but the packaging was not sufficient and it did not protect the device from UV exposure. 
And some hospitals were storing the device facing windows and they were of course exposed to the sun um, on a daily basis. And so this ended up resulting in the catheters cracking and becoming embrittled and basically failing um, when they were implanted in the, in the patient. Um, so when we were asked to investigate this, GPC was used to basically confirm this polymer degradation and give evidence that um, there was a, a molecular reason for the physical properties being compromised. And so in addition to this, you could do um, sort of uh, studies that basically attempt to reproduce the failure. So some of these analytical techniques um, allow you to have a hypothesis and then you can um, try to test a hypothesis by subjecting um, samples in order to try to recreate the failure. And now I'm going to hand it back over to Jennifer. <clears throat> Thank you, Carolyn. Um, we received a lot of questions about multi-layer constructions, um, so we'll spend a few minutes on this. Um, basically, what's the sort of the stack up? And uh, it can be a freestanding multi-layer film, like for food packaging, for instance. Um, it could also be you have multiple organic layers that are in a, um, st in a stack on a substrate. The substrate could be inorganic, organic. Um, and then um, we also have a, questions related to like different ways of probing and analyzing the layers. So what I'm showing you on this slide is is kind of like how to we approached a, um, a multi-layer construction which is a polymer a free uh, you know a clear basically you know uh, transparent um, polymer flexible polymer film and uh, we basically want to look at it in a couple of different ways. One is we can look at it top down by analyzing from the surfaces, uh, but we could also mount it, um, mount it, cross section it, and analyze it in cross section. So um, in this particular case, it was best suited for kind of a combination of, of those, but I, what I have shown here is um, an SEM image uh, which is showing you that it's a four layer construction and it's uh, encapsulated in epoxy. And you can see um, we can measure from this technique, we can measure the thicknesses of the layers. And then we have a better idea of which techniques that we can actually use to, to characterize the composition of the layers. So initially um, we did a uh, FTIR analysis in um, attenuated total reflectance mode on the exterior surfaces. So we could get information on the polymer family for layers one and four. Um, layer uh, layer one being uh, consistent with a polyethylene and layer four with a nylon and similar to nylon six, but we're not entirely certain um, just based on FTIR alone, uh, but it's a close match. And then when we did the cross section, we can see that the layer number two is less than 20 microns, so it's rather thin. It's too thin to uh, for FTIR. FTIR generally, you're looking at the chemical family um, of a, a spot size that's kind of um, on the order of 40 to 50 microns, and where whereas ramen can get down to one micron. So ramen was the more appropriate technique. Um, you could also use nano IR as well. Um, and so in this particular analysis, we use ramen for all four layers, and you can see it has good, um, it, it complements the FTIR results, but it also gives you additional information. Um, layer number four was actually, um, we can actually see that it's a blend of two different nylons, and um, there is an aromatic polyamide that's present that you wouldn't detect in, necessarily in the FTIR, and the reason being that ramen, um, is more sensitive to aromatics, and you get you tend to get more intense peaks when you have aromatics present. And then, based on the literature, um, and those of you who are in the packaging industry, MDX6 is commonly blended with nylon six for gas barrier application. So it was consistent with the literature. And then here's an example, a multi-layer film example, um, just to show you how. Um, uh, it's kind of sexy nano IR can be for giving you uh, 
beautiful images and, and mapping information of not only the chem chemical composition, but also the topography. So this is a, a three layer cross section. Um, you have ethylene vinyl alcohol as the middle layer about five microns in thickness. And these images in the middle of, uh, middle here are um, the top and the bottom image are basically where we've, uh, we're, we're mapping a specific uh, peak. And the, the, top, uh, in the, the top image is showing you the um, um, mapping of the 1050 peak, which is the characteristic peak for um, EVOH, which happens to be a uh, carbon oxygen stretch of a primary alcohol and you can see that it's brighter in the middle layer and then if you look at the bottom image we're looking at the 1645 um, peak which is a characteristic amide stretch for nylon materials and that's present in the outer layers um, in the middle you can see the topography that you know here we have a a cross-section sample. Um, you're not going to see a lot of topography but you can see that there is a, a little bit of a um, a difference at the interface between the layers um, because they cut differently. And then another question that we got related to, it's related to thermal analysis and thermal properties of polymers. So the next couple of slides are gonna kind of illustrate this. What's the preferred method to measure glass transition temperature? Now the most common method is uh, DSC, um, standard DSC uh, being the most common and then modulated DSC. If you have overlapping transitions, it's a good way to separate out those transitions, especially if you have like something like moisture that's coming off in the presence and you also have a glass transition, they're both endothermic, um, but one is reversible and one's not. Um, but basically the technique is heat flow versus temperature and time. So you're kind of looking at changes in heat capacity as you go through these transitions. Um, you can get heat capacity, um, specific heat measurements, you can get um, the melting temperature and the glass transition temperature and also cold crystallization if you're heating it up above the TG and also cooling it down from the melt, you can get a recrystallization. Um, so the degree of crystallinity, um, we'll talk about a little bit later, but you can also get that from, um, from doing uh, a DSC analysis. It's a relatively small sample mass and um, because TG is a second order thermodynamic transition, the measurement of TG is gonna be dependent on the rate of heating and cooling. Um, so faster heating rates are gonna amplify the step change in the heat capacity and heat flow through the TG, but they're also, it's gonna shift it to, to a slightly higher temperature than if you were to do the analysis at a slower heating rate. <clears throat> And then uh, there's other methods that can be used as well to assess the glass transition temperature. And really it's the best technique that is gonna be dependent on the type of material, its geometry, um, and then also how it's used. Um, so dynamic mechanical analysis is, is giving you viscoelastic information. And you're looking at an oscillatory stress or strain on the sample and you're getting information like storage and loss modulus and you know damping information, tan delta. What it's doing is it's probing the molecular motion. So as you can see from the, the plot on the right, which is storage modulus as a function of temperature, there's two different polymers, polycarb, two different amorphous polymers, polycarbonate and PVC. And you can see that um, polycarbonate is stiffer um, up to a higher temperature. Its glass transition temperature is around 150 to 160 Celsius. Um, but what, what's important to note here is that because it's based on molecular motions, you can see that uh, there's a huge drop, um, a significant change or step transition in, the, more, in the, the stiffness of the material when you go through the glass transition temperature for an amorphous material. For semi-crystalline materials, it'll be a much uh, smaller um, order of magnitude. And then when you get to cross-linked or heavily filled materials, even smaller. TMA is another technique that can be used. It's really, uh, you need a flat parallel surface and it's based on dimensional changes versus temperature. You can also get CTE in addition to TG. And then uh, we received questions about um, how do you assess crystallinity. Um, generally speaking, you can use DSC analysis. If you have flat films or sheets and relatively flat samples, then you can consider like X-ray diffraction. Density measurements are also used, um, especially when you're concerned about um, 
different uh, post-crystallization, partial melting, annealing, and recrystallization can all are all events that can occur over the course of a DSC scan. So you're actually sweeping through uh, the melt the melt of the material in order to to determine the crystallinity. And so a lot of things can be going on. And it might be an artificially high level of crystallinity. But just if you're doing comparative analysis, the area under the melting peak is proportional to the crystallinity. So as you increase crystallinity, that area under the peak will increase. Um, and then assessing polymer cure, it depends. So there's assessing, getting like a cure profile of a material that you're starting with an uncured uh, liquid. It could be low viscosity, high viscosity liquid or a B stage material. And then you're going to subject it to different temperatures and time conditions. And you want to know whether, you want to know what's the optimal conditions for curing on one um, side. And the other side, you might want to know after it's cured, these two lots are behaving differently. Can, can you check to see if there's evidence of under cure? So here are some examples of techniques in the table here um, where you can, again, use thermal analysis techniques to tease out um, levels of cure and also do cure studies. Um, commonly, uh, DSC is used for cure studies and also uh, um, a rheometer, starting from like a liquid and, and curing it thermally. Um, we can do in situ curing and analysis. With FTIR, you can look at changes in peak ratios where something is being consumed during the reaction and, and then you can do like relative to a peak that isn't changing. So this is really good for uh, UV curable systems. Um, the image that you see on the right or the plot on the right is just an example of uh, curing the same system but uh, at one temperature but you're curing it for different amounts of, amounts of time and you can see that uh, the more time that you cure it the flatter the baseline is and you're basically seeing a residual cure of the material that hasn't cured during your curing profile. So the shorter the time of cure, the more of a residual exotherm you can see. And you can actually monitor this as a, a gauge of, of crystallinity chain of cure. And also shifts in glass transition temperature are another way of checking. So now we're gonna switch to, uh, we have two case studies that we'd like to present and I'm gonna hand this back over to Carolyn to present the first case study. Thank you. All right, so um, so this is the first case study. So we got a question, <clears throat> how do I approach the study of a polymer with a very limited associated research? I'd like to characterize it as much as I can. So we thought that this question um, could be kind of best illustrated uh, using some information uh, about our approach for deformulation. So, Deformulation is you know, performing a bunch of analytical techniques with the goal of both identifying and quantifying ingredients. So you can deformulate um, many different types of things, but certainly you can perform deformulations on polymers. So for this example, we decided to use an artificial holiday tree. We were going to do some techniques to kind of illustrate the process of deformulation. So, um, in a deformulation, we have the, the freedom to kind of throw the kitchen sink at it. We have a lot of different analytical tools here at Eurofins EAG, and we have the freedom to use them in order to try to get an answer. So spectroscopic techniques, thermal techniques, chromatographic techniques, and then we even use um, you know, good old fashioned wet chemistry. So we perform what we call a customized series of solvent extractions, and then we isolate fractions, and then we determine gravimetrically, um, you know, how much a, a certain fraction is in terms of its weight percent. So let me just jump into some data. So again, uh, we kind of start out with the screening techniques that we talk about. Um, so FTIR is a screening technique. It's quick, it's easy. Um, so we took some needles from the artificial tree. We performed uh, uh, ATR, uh, FTIR spectroscopy of it, and then we compare it to our commercial library. And so uh, this particular tree, and um, 
I think there's a lot of trees out there with this, uh, with a, a similar polymer composition is uh, consistent with a, a PVC type material. Um, you know, the, the library can kind of give you the top 10 matches and, and based on the consistency of the same answer, you can kind of determine that. Now, if you know the structure of PVC, uh, you might be looking at some of the peaks here and like wondering, okay, what, what's that from? Because I, uh, I, so I'm looking at like the, the carbonyl region. And, um, if you know a little bit, bit about PVC, you know, you have rigid PVC like pipes, um, but then you also have flexible PVC. So what we're seeing here is PVC, but there's also a significant amount of uh, small molecule plasticizers in there that make it flexible. Now, um, again, we said with FTIR, um, you know, the signals all kind of coalesce on top of each other. Um, so it did sort of indicate that, you know, an ester was present, a plasticizer was present, but um, because it was kind of mixed in with everything else in the formulation, you couldn't really tell which one. That's where you have to go to other techniques, and we'll get to that in just a minute. So we kind of moved to the next screening technique. So we first got you know, mostly an organic fingerprint or profile, we moved to SEM EDS to get the inorganic profile. So we took some of the needles and we popped it in our scanning electron microscope. Um, sometimes we can use that to get an image of the morphology. In this case, we mostly just used it to get an elemental profile. So we, we screen this material. And um, so we go through the list of elements and we try to assign them from what we know from other techniques. So. No surprise, uh, the, the FTIR data suggested that it was a PVC material, so we see a very intense chlorine peak, also a, a carbon peak. Um, so then we also see an oxygen, calcium, and titanium. So the oxygen, of course, is gonna be probably a mixture of both an organic component and inorganic component. So we mentioned the plasticizers, so that's uh, one part of it. Um, most likely the titanium is due to titanium dioxide, um, which is a, a whitening material that's probably used to kind of modify the color. Uh, the calcium, um, there's probably a couple of different, you know, reasons that it could be in there. It could be both, it could be one or the other. Um, so one idea that we had, it, it could also be a, a calcium carbonate filler, um, but it could also be due to some type of like calcium stearate type of metal salt um, of a fatty acid. And so in order to answer that question, we would need additional information. So this is a case where uh, if we wanted that specific information, we could probably uh, do x-ray diffraction on it, but there are other techniques that can also help answer this question. So usually in a deformulation, kind of the goal is to figure out, you know, what are the, what are the major, minor, and trace components and roughly how, how much uh, weight percent do they add up to. So a TGA um, just kind of gives you a reality check. So if you're trying to put, you know, different components into buckets, um, you know, ideally they're gonna add up to something close to 100%. So first, like the TGA is going to take your sample, it's going to heat it, uh, and you're gonna monitor the weight loss as a function of temperature. So first, if you start heating, you're gonna lose your volatile material. In this case, there's not a lot of volatile material. So we, we see very little weight loss until we get to uh, above 200. Um, 200 for this particular system is where a couple of things start to happen. Both um, the polymer starts to degrade, so you have dehydrochlorination or dehydrohalogenation of the PVC. Um, which results in releasing of HCl, but then you also have plasticizer decomposition that's kind of happening at the same time. And they're not, they sort of happen um, not in distinct weight steps. So they're both um, representative of that one weight loss. And then you have chemistry going on um, for the organic uh, components. Things are rearranging, recycle. And then um, at a certain temperature, they're going, going to kind of reach, you know, uh, sort of a maximum uh, decomposition. Sometimes with some components, um, they don't completely degrade and they show up as kind of a carbonaceous char material. So in order to sort of, uh, uh, you know, continue with that, at some point you might introduce air or oxygen, that's going to combine and it's going to combust any remaining char associated with 
decomposed organic material. And then what's left over is the thermally stable inorganic material here, which shows up as a, a residue. And so then finally, uh, here's an example of a chromatographic technique. So you could take the polymer, you could perform a solvent extraction. Uh, ideally, you'll select a solvent that leaves the polymer intact. Uh, you don't want to be shooting polymer like onto your GC or LC column. Um, you know, you might have something that swells the polymer. Um, and releases the small molecule addi additives into solution. And then you can inject that onto your GC or LCMS. It can separate and detect it based on mass spectrometry. And so here's kind of a list of what we found in this artificial tree. We saw, found some uh, degradants and impurities. Uh, we found some reaction products with uh, some fatty acids. So that is, um, data that supports maybe the calcium is due to like a calcium stearate type salt. Um, and we are able to identify uh, plasticizer additives. So I think we probably expected phthalates. We know the type of phthalates that they are. Um, I didn't necessarily expect the Citroflex. Um, and that's a little bit interesting because it's sort of marketed as more of a more environmentally friendly uh, plasticizer versus the phthalates. So why they had both, I don't know, but um, that's, that's what we found. And now I'll turn it back over to Jennifer because she is our failure analysis expert. All right, thank you, Carolyn. <clears throat> All right, so to, to kind of uh, wrap up here with a, a small case study, um, since we, are, we do have time constraints here, we would like to save some time for your uh, live questions. Um, generally, I mean, we do a lot of failure analysis here and it, across all different types of materials, but specifically with polymers, um, really the kind of the approach is not different um, than other materials. We try to determine what the scope of the issue is. Um, we ask a lot of questions to try to understand if this issue is new or recurring, if it's isolated to a specific time period or manufacturing lot, or maybe a geographical location where your customer is using your product. Um, and then we also want to know what are the failure characteristics or features? What's Define what failure means to you. Um, and then we kind of look at the full life cycle of, of the component or the product. And we're looking at uh, not only the kind of what are the specifications as part of the design in terms, you know, like the geometry and the raw and the materials that, that are in the construction, um, but the raw materials that um, are, are being used to um, like mold your components, for instance, or in, in the manufacturing process, if it's some sort of melt processing, maybe the resin isn't being dried properly and it's a moisture sensitive polymer, like a, a, a nylon or a polycarbonate. Um, and therefore you're, uh, do, you're affecting the molecular weight of the material, which is causing embrittlement and cracking, for instance. It could be end use conditions as well. Um, is it load bearing? Um, is, is it seeing chemicals? Um, you know, that sort of thing. And then we, we uh, develop a scope based on available samples, um, budget, obviously, we want to stay within um, your constraints. Uh, and then if it's urgent to you, it's urgent to us. Um, and, and then, you know, based on the information provided. So really what we're looking for is, you know, what's different? Uh, the image on the right is just an example of a fracture surface. So we do a lot of fractography if you have cracked uh, components um, to understand the failure mode. Um, where is it originating from? Does it look to be uh, you know, mechanic, uh, mechan mechanical failure or chemically assisted? Um, and we check things like composition, morphology, and material properties, and again, comparative analysis. Um, and if it's, a, if it's complicated, we will have a project manager assigned and they can help kind of coordinate everything and do and consult with you on what the results mean and, and re recommended next steps. So um, the next, a couple of slides, it's just a, a case study on food packaging. In this particular case, it was uh, used, um, there's a, a heat sealed multi-layer film that's used to 
protect a um, for shelf life for a particular food product and um, you can see in the construction here on the left that there's a blue ink and this ink was bleeding from the packaging film into the food product now the ink is supposed to be housed in between two polymer layers an outer web which is a, a PET barrier and um, and then an inner web, which is the heat seal layer in this particular case, like for example, ethylene vinyl acetate. Um, and it's folded over onto itself to create the, the seals at the ends of the packaging um, using pressure and temperature to create that seal to melt that uh, heat seal layer to get to itself. Um, in this particular case, there were two film vendors. Um, one was exhibiting ink migration into the food product um, at the seal location. And so the hypothesis here was that there was poor inner layer bond strength in the failed packaging and there was excessive flow and tearing of the film during heat sealing. So the initial step was we wanted to take a look at it under the microscope. Um, and this is just a kind of a zoomed in image of a heat seal of the, the good versus bad um, the vendor's not good and bad necessarily, just the product that the, the packaging film are calling good versus bad. You can see that for the good one, there's, you know, maybe some areas, there's some trapped air bubbles or where it kind of folded over on itself, but there's no like real channels of like where leaks could come through. And uh, whereas the bad, um, you can see that there's these pretty significant mi millimeter sized tears right at the, uh, at the heat seal. And so you're blowing through basically uh, all the layers and allowing for a path for that ink to, to, to migrate. And so uh, what we did is we devised a peel test. So we initiated the peel using a chemical to kind of uh, uh, start the peeling process. And then we hooked it up to an instron and we did a 90 degree peel test on the good versus bad. And you can see they're very distinctly different failure modes. Vendor A, the good film, um, was so, the adhesion between the layers was so strong that we failed the, the web itself. It broke in the plastic layer itself. And the vendor B, you can see that um, the, we reached a, a lower peak load before it started to peel. You could essentially peel this with your hand. That's how weakly bonded it was. And it's repeatable. So you can see um, the difference between the two. And in this particular case, additional testing wasn't performed to further determine the root cause because there was sufficient inf information with the poor adhesion that the client could take that to their supplier to have a, dis uh, a discussion on, on sort of what to do next. And then, and then lastly, uh, this is a very good question. Um, what is the most common misconception you hear when talking to your customers that you'd like to set straight? Um, I think uh, the biggest one is when we do deformulations, um, will it provide an ex uh, a, a recipe for an exact copy of the product? And can you tell us who the, the, the resin grade and supplier is based on a dis deformulation? And the answer is, generally speaking is no, and there's many reasons for this. So if you look at um, kind of the output of a deformulation, we're gonna give you sort of a table that lists, in this case, this is a, a qualitative list of what was detected. Um, we can also quantify as well and tell you how much of each of these ingredients are in the formulation. But this isn't necessarily representative of the formulation before it was processed. And if, if we're provided uh, molded parts, extruded tubing, um, you know, cross-linked, uh, materials, we do a deformulation, we can only give you so much information. And uh, when you look at the um, what's out there in terms of uh, available resins, like if you're trying to find an alternative source or a replacement resin because you, you no longer have availability for that, um, and you're trying to find an exact replica of that, we can give you a, a adequate information to go to your uh, supplier or your compounder or your partner labs to discuss, you know, like here are sort of the main polymer family, here's the ratio in the copolymer, um, Here's the, uh, you know, some physical property information, thermal analysis. Here's the glass transition temperature and, and give you kind of a snapshot of the material, but we can't tell you how it was made. And we, and a lot of the ingredients may have reacted and or gotten consumed from the, the original raw material to the state that it's in when we do the analysis. So with that, I'm going to transition to uh, Janneke to, uh, for the Q&A um, portion of the presentation. 
Thank you so much, Jennifer. We have time for a few questions. I'm gonna start with uh, Carolyn. The question we have is, what meth methods are available at EEG for testing outgassing VOCs from polymeric materials? Okay, um, so, so we have a, a number of different uh, techniques that we've used for this. Um, most of them sort of center around a GCMS technique, but it's just a question of how we do the sampling. So um, we have available to us both a you know static headspace testing and dynamic headspace testing. So for the static, you could have uh, you know just a traditional headspace GCMS. If you need greater sensitivity, uh, you might want a SPEMI analysis, solid phase micro extraction. Um, but for that, you kind of have to, uh, you, you need to kind of know what you're looking for. I mean, there are general SPEMI fibers, but um, sometimes it's like, well, you know, how do I know which one to choose? Um, so there's actually uh, another technique, thermal desorption technique, uh, which is a dynamic uh, technique for sampling. And it's able to, to you know, sample a large volume uh, of, headspace and then sort of concentrate that down in order to get really sensitive uh, detection limits. So we have a, a number of, of different approaches in order to try to get the best information. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for that answer. Uh, there's another question that came in about good online or free databases for FTIR spectra. Um, so there are some databases online. Uh, one of my favorite is the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, AIST, from Japan. Um, there's also um, a number of other resources, such as the NIST um, Chemistry Webbook, um, and also Sigma Aldridge. For all the compounds they have, they, they often have FTR spectra. But I will have to say the best libraries are the ones you have to pay for, unfortunately. Um, so, okay, another question, Jennifer. Um, we have a question, what is the most uh, frequent failure occurrence that you've seen in your, in your studies for the past 10 years? What's common polymer failure? Well, at EAG, since I've only been with EAG for four years, I can only speak <laughs> to that. But I, I guess I think um, uh, what we commonly see, uh, we see a lot of uh, cracking issues with plastics, um, mostly thermoplastics. Uh, some some uh, epoxy uh, components that are rigid, um, but environmental stress cracking is one of the biggest ones. And um, at, as you know, over, over the course of the pandemic, we used a lot of disinfectants to wipe down surfaces um, and, and more fr uh, higher frequency, right? And so this sort of cyclic uh, exposure to disinfectants is... Um, you know, can, can be an Achilles heel for a thermal, some th thermoplastics, and you start to see cracking, crack more and more cracking uh, occurrences. Anything that that's handheld or in a hospital setting, or just in general, um, you're 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 getting a lot of contact with uh, with chemicals. Discoloration is another one, um, like yellowing, uh, and those are the most challenging ones to. Uh, to investigate, won't get into the details, but generally speaking, it's really hard to isolate and identify the the chromophore, what's causing the, the discoloration. And generally it's present in really low concentrations. Um, but we have ways of kind of teasing that out. Um, we don't always uh, get, get the answer necessarily. And then lastly, delamination, which I already gave an example of delamination. That's a really common. Coatings, adhesives, paint, you know, paints um, and, and films. Thank you for that. Um, there's one more question, Carolyn, uh, and I don't know if you know the answer to this. Um, can pyrolysis GC be done on a polymer suspension, such as a aqueous suspension? Um, so mo we do like to kind of introduce uh, our sample as a solid. So we have had some liquid and maybe suspension materials um, that, so, uh, for pyrolysis GCMS, uh, kind of the, 
the physical place that you put the specimen is it like called a pyrolysis cup. It's kind of this tiny little stainless steel, looks like the top of like, if you're familiar with like those clicky pens, um, looks like that. So you, you fill that. So we've had situations where we put um, liquid or suspension samples in there. And then, um, you know, we might, uh, you know, blow nitrogen on it or uh, heat it, um, basically uh, find a way to, you know, get rid of like most of the water or the moisture and uh, leave leave the, you know, suspended material behind and then go ahead and perform the experiment. Perfect. Thank you for that answer. Okay, we have one more question um, and that is of all the techniques presented, how many of these capabilities does EAG have in-house? And I can answer that one. Actually, everything we talked about, we do have in-house. Um, so that's we, we provide examples of, of, of actual samples we had run on our instruments. Okay, um, so this is kind of a summary. There's so many different techniques that you can use uh, for different purposes, uh, chromatographic techniques, spectrographic, thermal analysis, and again, these all are techniques we have in-house. So I'd like to summarize. Um, I hope that we've shown you um, that we at EAG have a breadth of polymer characterization knowledge and expertise, and we provide a tailored approach to, to solving your polymeric material problems. Um, we, we are present during all cycles of, all stages of the product life cycle from polymer selection to post-market failure analysis. Um, and thank you so much for your attention. And I just have a couple more words to say about why why choose EAG. Um, well, the the most important thing for us is is client con confidentiality. Um, we take it really seriously. We know it's important to our clients. Um, and and actually, you know, we're all really passionate about doing um, the analysis and and running the instruments. We um, a lot of us are thought leaders in, in these uh, techniques. We have lots of knowledge and expertise. We've run different kinds of samples. Uh, and we really have a multidisciplinary approach. We, we try to you know, use different techniques. Um, we can scale with your demand and meet your time constraints. Um, and we have thousands of instruments. We have accreditations. Um, 19, uh, 9, oh, uh, 901 and 17025. Um, and overall, we're just a leader in materials testing. We can help you solve your problems. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to our presenters and to you for attending today's event. Uh, if we didn't get to your questions today, we will follow up with you very soon. And if you have additional questions, please send them to the email address on the screen. I've added a few links to our resources in the chat window. Please check those out. And once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we would really appreciate your feedback. Um, on behalf of Eurofins EAG Laboratories and our experts, thank you so much for joining us and have a great day. Bye. <laughs>